morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is uh, Tom Spencer. I'm one of the members here at the, uh, the West Church. Um, a number of uh, years ago, um, whilst I was at work, I was kind of really struggling. Um, when I uh, started the job I was doing, I, I felt that's where God really wanted me to be. But a number of years in, um, I was having a bit of a difficult time. So, um, you know, I was praying about it and things. I hadn't really mentioned it to anyone other than um, my wife at the time, Chloe. And, um, yeah, I was really struggling. And uh, one day I got a phone call from one of my close friends who I hadn't mentioned anything to. Um, and she, she phoned me up and she said, oh, I was praying for you this morning, Tom. And um, I really felt like God was telling you that you're in the right job, you're in the right place, and to stick at it. Um, and it was just the most encouraging um, news I could have got. Um, and within a couple of months, my work completely transformed. Um, and I'm still in the job uh, today and really enjoy what I'm, what I'm doing and feel um, I'm definitely in the right place. And I think quite a lot of the time, we, we often, in our busy lives, sometimes forget to listen to God and listen to what he's got to say or sometimes listen to what he's telling us to tell other people. Um, so we're going to start the service off a little bit differently this morning um, and we're just going to have a bit of quiet time and a bit of time of reflection um, just, to, just to listen to what God might have to say to you this morning or to see whether God's got anything that he would like to put on your heart to maybe tell somebody else. Um, so I'm going to ask the band just to start playing and um, just stay in your seats. Um, and uh, yeah, take a bit of time. And I'm just going to read a little bit here now from Scripture. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving.
um, there's a couple of bits of news or opportunities for you to think about that we want to tell everybody before Junior Church and that go out. So first of all, I'm going to ask Don to come up and speak to us a little bit about some good news. And then after that, Denise is going to come. Thank you very much, Tony. Morning. I thought I had only one piece of good news to say this morning, but in fact, I've got two. I've got two because um, uh, uh, only a, a friend has returned from Keith, and she's been able to bring with her her friend Julia Billus and her son Ivan and their friend uh, Victoria. So, well, would you like to stand up so everyone can see you? It's really, really wonderful and a very warm welcome. Nice to see you. It's taken several months to get their visas, but anyhow, it's wonderful to see you here at last. You remember, perhaps just before Christmas, we launched a, a, a campaign to raise funds for some uh, institutions in the Kiev region. And um, we started the fundraising and We've raised it, we've identified through um, the help of Helena uh, Parasova and her friend in Kiev, Anna. We identified six institutions um, ranging from old people's home to um, uh, places that provide therapy and help for children who have been uh, traumatized. And the good news is that we've, that we've raised enough money to buy the first generator. Uh, of the six, and here you see it, beautiful uh, three-phase, uh, seven-kilowatt generator, diesel, and th this is wonderful, and we're absolutely delighted that um, through Belina's help, she was able to identify a supplier in Kiev and to get the money out there, which wasn't easy, um, but she's amazed. Uh, so this is the this is generator. Can we have the next slide, please? And here you see the generator outside uh, the home, and uh, you can see second from the right is uh, Helena um, alongside the, um, the director of the, of the home, the old people's home at Tarashenki. Um, all of you will give you the correct, correct pronunciation later. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and this is the, this is the, uh, the cable being plugged into the main fuse box, um, and then the next slide is up to now that the, the, the baking and, and, and the cooking has had to be done um, uh, in wood heated uh, ovens and wood heated stoves so that having the generator has really made a huge difference and if we can have the next slide please because there you see the ovens um, and if we can have the next slide this is the first batch of bread that has been able to be cooked um, in the ovens powered by the generator, which you paid for. The next slide, please. Yeah, so there we see Helena's on the left, and you see them all holding, um, holding the loaves of bread that have been, uh, have been freshly baked. So if we could have the next slide, please. Yeah. So the thing is that, that that's the first generator, and we would like to get another five um, generators. So I, I, I I've got these new leaflets that have got a QR code on, and for those who are technically minded with a smartphone, you can go instantly to the um, to the website, um, which is people's uh, fundraising slash donation slash power to Ukraine. So you, you can see the website on the on the slide there. Um, but please, if you have a spare pounds or something in your pocket. If you'd like to donate it after the service, then that would be wonderful. But thank you very much, and thank you for your generosity, for everyone who's just chipped in. It's been very, very much appreciated. Thank you. to an event in Aberdeen United. Um, it's hosted out by King's Church that my son's a member of and we, the young people love it basically. So we're looking for people to provide lifts 
Uh, aside from the fitful young people in my car, <laughs> which isn't enough. Um, and I know Fraser is keen to help as well, but if anybody else is available on that evening that can provide lifts to and from Cummings Church, we won't be doing McDonald's trip this time because they're doing burgers and ice cream on site. So we're not going to pay McDonald's, we won't pay the people at Cummings instead. So it's, they're, they're going to have stuff inside, I think, or a phone party or something like that, and the burgers and ice cream bar. So anybody is welcome to come along, but yeah, if you could help, then you, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. And related to that, um, over the last weekend, um, from Tuesday to Monday, um, a recruiting group of eight, I think, including minister, elders, parents, youth volunteers, and young people, um, interviewed four candidates for our poster um, youth coordinator um, after prayer and consideration. Really high quality candidates, the group were unanimous, then um, offered a post to a person on Wednesday morning, and they accepted. So we will have a new youth coordinator starting probably before the end of term. Her name is Sharon Wilkinson, and she'll be full time. She is currently um, has been a member for a long time and a volunteer doing youth ministry in Eastside Christian Fellowship Church. She lives in Germany, and she's partway through a BA uh, a degree course in theology, focused specifically on youth ministry. So you'll get to meet her and her family hopefully next Sunday, um, even though she's not going to be in post towards the end of the term. So please. Pray for Sharon and her family. Sharon and Mark live in Toronto with their three kids. So pray for them over the next wee while as we have that transition. But that's good news. I'm going to invite Aileen to come forward because we've got yet another opportunity for you to help out. So two or three weeks ago, I asked uh, that we remove the poster for more tutors for our Ukrainians. Given that we thought we had two or three spare. However, today, I think we need at least two more. So this is up to me if you or any of your friends are willing to you know, have a go at this, then if you could speak to me after the service or to Ruth Blair, if she's a human children, um, and let us know, and that would be great. Thank you. A great opportunity, and you get an awful lot of support from doing that as well. I know the group of people who are involved in that are really enjoying that, so please think about that. I'm also going to invite another Donald forward this morning, so Donald Wood is going to come and join us at the front just for a wee second. So I, um, as part of the, all the churches nearby, so the collections of churches, of churches of Scotland, coming together in different ways, um, operate together in something called a presbytery. And up to the December of this last year, our local presbytery was about 17 different churches, so we would have roughly 30 or 40 people would come and minister an elder together every so often and organise different things and support things for each other. As of January the 1st, six presbyteries in the North East and the Northern Isles came together to form one presbytery. So we've now got 147 congregations, a whole lot of ministers and elders, and we're working together to work out how that is going to operate. We're learning a lot of new things, meeting a lot of new people. One of the ways I'm helping that presbytery out is in something called presbytery mission planning. And that's the way that the church nationally is trying to cope with the fact that there are less ministers around and that there are a lot of places where the um, church isn't quite sustainable either the building or other reasons. And so we're trying to help folk to work together. Uh, I'm part of a committee that's working towards that. And more recently, we became aware of Donald. Donald has been finishing off as what's known as a probationer, so finishing off the training as a Church of Scotland minister. Prior to that, he was a lecturer in theology as well, so he's got plenty of experience. And the Church of Scotland wants to provide for folk in that position who aren't able to just go and get themselves a church at this point because there are a lot of churches that aren't in the vacancy yet until they work out what they're going to do. So one of the ways that the Church of Scotland is supporting folk like that is saying if there's a role in the presbytery that is worthwhile, that will extend your gifts and calling and keep you employed and be helpful to the presbytery, then we will fund that. So we have arranged for Donald to become a mission development worker for the presbytery. So we'll be supporting the kind of work I'm doing, which is helping congregations, Kirk Sessions, to talk to each other about their futures and how the best way to sort those out are. He lives in Ockenglade with his family, so we're going to try and limit it to within a reasonable driving distance. But one of the ways that's operated is that you have a line manager. 
And so Donald's line manager is me, and officially he's employed by our quick session. So he's officially going to be assistant minister in due course over the next week while he'll be ordained, and then we'll arrange that for him. So you may or may not over the next week while hear about Donald Wood and hear about our assistant minister, um, but you might never see him. <laughs> and, and that's because he's out and about working with me and with other folks to further these companies conversations and to help folk. Also, as part of his gifts and talents, he will be helping out probably on Sundays in various places and vacancies and other places that do worship as well. So I want you to see who he was. I'm not going to get him to make any speeches this, this morning. I, I said I'd let him off that. He may or may not be involved with us in my at different times, but if you see him around, then definitely speak to him. He's going to be around today afterwards where we'll have our tea and coffee where you can ask more about him and we'll include him very much in our prayers. kindness has brought us another new morning. Help us to leave yesterday. Not to worry too much about tomorrow, but to accept the uniqueness of today. By your love, which we read about in the Bible, which we see in the life of Jesus Christ, which the Spirit brings near. Take from us today anything we don't need to carry any longer, so that we can be free again to serve you and to be served by each other. Lord, whether we realize it or not, you favor us with your presence daily. Not just through the visits of angels, but through people we meet day in, day out. Sometimes we find that meeting hard. Don't let us be afraid. Help us to accept each day gladly seeing you in everyone we meet. Kindle in our hearts today a flame of love for our world, for our neighbours, and for our foes, for our friends, and for all your people. In the quiet, we bring to you our burdens, our concerns, the places, the situations, the people that concern us the most. And we place in your hands those who are willing to serve, just like Donald and his family and Sharon and her family. And so we take a few moments to bring to you our own concerns, prayers and burdens. entitled to sin, faith, duty. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, 
forgiven. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose all of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because what he did, because he did what he was told to? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Amen. This is the word of God. Now, lots of people ask me how I remain so humble. <laughs> I'll say that again. Lots of people ask me how I remain so humble. Now, it seems to me that the point of humility is not to direct everyone's attention to yourself or to try and make people aware of how great you think you are. It's obviously a ridiculous statement to make. Anyone who is humble is not somebody who wants to draw attention to themselves or to make themselves seem better than anyone else. So this is a, a crazy kind of statement to make and a great way to make a joke. Um, there's a great set of stories, books that uh, I enjoy, and in them there is a, a machine that's designed as a threat to kind of coerce people to do things. And this is a very interesting machine. It's a machine that actually... So the threat of this machine is that this machine, when you go in the machine, it shows you exactly where you are and how you fit into the entire infinite universe. Next slide. And everybody who is put in the machine, when they realize what they are, how tiny and insignificant they are, because the whole universe is driven insane. And so it's used as a threat. But the joke in the book is that the character who is threatened by this, he goes into the machine and he comes out with a big smile on his face because he went into the machine assuming he was the most important person in the universe and he comes out having it confirmed. <laughs> now obviously that's ridiculous, but this idea of where we fit in and what we, how we fit into the bigger picture is an interesting one about comparing ourselves. Um, experts, those who are wise, those who have studied, those who have tried to help people in lots of different ways are pretty much universal in saying if, if you want to be dissatisfied, if you want to stay awake all night, if you want to be miserable, there are two things to focus on. Next slide. And this is a guarantee for misery and that's to focus on comparing yourself, comparison to other people, or focus on entitlement, thinking that you deserve anything actually. Uh, and then feeling, obviously, resentment that you don't have that. If you focus on either of those in your life, you're guaranteeing yourself misery. And that is ancient wisdom, actually. We are looking today, again, and we've been wrestling and working our way through an ancient story. It's a story that's set more than 2,000 years ago in a completely different ancient environment. A young Jewish teacher named Jesus of Nazareth is causing a fuss in his homeland in the north particular of a country called Israel. And then as we follow the story collected for us in a book that we call Luke, we have seen him travel and take a journey from the north down to the south and he's now aiming to get to the capital city Jerusalem. And on that way we're seeing much more about how he lives, the people he surrounds him with and the reactions of those around him. Next slide. When we get to chapter 17, 
So far, there's been a huge amount of fuss, lots of crowds gathering around him. And these are Jewish people, and he is a Jewish man in a Jewish setting, but he's also living under the heel, actually, like most countries were at that time of the Roman Empire. And so that's the ancient context that he is in. And as he's journeyed, he's also had his critics who come at him for all sorts of different reasons, often from his own faith. In particular, a group more recently in this part of the story have been criticizing him for who he spends his time with, and he's told different stories, and he's reacted to that after those stories. So he's been telling some stories about wealth. But after those, Luke, our writer who's inspired and collecting this material together, then sets out for us just a few different things that Jesus seems to say, particularly to the 12 young men that he's surrounding himself with for these three years. So he's not telling a, a bigger story here, it just seems to be a collection of sayings that come after these three stories about wealth. And so the first thing he says, first piece of advice, it seems to be a warning. He says to his followers, he says, there are things that cause people to stumble and they're bound to come now, all the way through the Jewish story, all the way this, through the, this collection of books we call the Bible, all the way th through the, the, the story that Jesus would have lived out, his own story of his people and their God, have said that there is a creator God who knows that the world is not the way he meant it to be, that he made it to be, that the creation is broken, and that in all sorts of different ways he is working to put that back together. But the recognition is that it's broken. And Jesus is saying that there. There will be things that stop people following me in the way they're meant to, following my, our God in the way they're meant to, living out their lives the way they were made to. There were things that are going to stop them doing that. But this is a warning because more than that, more than people stumbling, and we'll see that word in a second, there's a, a warning for even worse than people stumbling because that's bound to happen, but also being the cause of that. Next slide. He uses a Greek word, and that word is scandalon, and that's where we get the word scandal. And there's a reason we have the word scandal, and it's a reason that, sadly, in lots of different stories and situations, we know of those who are role models, often in very public roles, who have something exposed in their life that causes a scandal. And that also causes a huge amount of distrust and disappointment, and even more than that for the people around us. So this is something we're incredibly aware of a reality. Next slide. Jesus, being a Jewish teacher, then goes on and tells a really exaggerated picture story. And all, all, all the way through we've been seeing, he's been designing word pictures. And here we have a picture of a millstone. A millstone was a huge round stone you could barely lift that was pulled around often by animals and would grind on top of another stone that um, grain until it became flour. It had a big square hole in the middle normally. And it's an image here of having one of those tied around your neck and then thrown in the sea, an extreme thing that obviously would never happen. But in here, Jesus is using this word picture to say, not that this is what should happen to those who make people stumble, but it would be better actually to have that than how serious that is. And he uses a couple of phrases. Next slide. He talks about little ones. He says, those who cause these little ones to stumble, and we often think he means children. And so often scandals are about how children are treated, sadly. But that word in these stories isn't limited to children. It's actually used of all ages, and it tends to mean more about those who are vulnerable. And often, at different times, Jesus will talk about his disciples, his followers, as being little ones. I am a little one. And the concern here is that it's going to be hard enough for folk to live out how God wants them to be. And even worse for those who actively, in some ways, get in the way of that or cause lack of trust or cause abuse or anything else that affects these loved ones. That's how valuable they are. Next slide. There's a comfort in this and thinking, well, that only applies to those who are teachers or those who are role models. Until we think a wee bit more carefully about that, and something that we come and think about time and time again in here as we talk about our youth work and our children's work and the fact that we are made to be a family of all different generations who all are affecting each other, which means every single one of us is a role model. And so this story is a little less comfortable. Next, next slide. Jesus goes on. He then talks about brothers and sisters who sin against you. He says, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. And then even if they sin against you seven times a day, seven times in the back, he's saying, I repent, you must forgive them. 
Now this seems like a little bit more of a comfortable piece of advice, because it seems at first glance that this is about people who do things wrong and being able to give them a rally. So that sounds good, because that makes us feel better if we can see other people doing something wrong and we can point it out. However, next slide. Jesus, first of all, talks about your brothers and sisters. So he's not talking about looking around you and trying to find somebody you think is not loving or doing the things God made them to do, and then pointing that out. Instead, he specifically talks about brothers and sisters, not your little brothers, literal brothers and sisters. In the context they're in, they would have been thinking about their group, their family group, their social group, their tribe, their nation, the Israelite people. Your brothers and sisters are who you operate with your community. And this is if in a situation where one of them does something against you specifically. So it's not as you wander around looking at people finding fault in what they do, it's actually a specific thing that is affected to you. In that case, he says, you are to rebuke them. And the word there is a, a word we tend to see rebuke as giving somebody a right, giving somebody into trouble. But that word has much more of a sense of uncovering something, of bringing something into the light, of not keeping something deep within us, but actually and making sure that if there's somebody who is doing something that affects us personally, we bring that to light. And then, if they repent, and that's another deep word we've come across time and time again, that has the sense of turning around, of coming back, of coming home. If they turn around, then we are to forgive. And then, we are to keep bringing it up time and time again, so they don't forget it and gossip about it to other people and remind them in the heat of arguments of the thing that they did. You know, he doesn't say any of those things at all. Instead he says, forgive, forgive, forgive. And if you read that little section again, there's an awful lot more forgiveness in there than there is about rebuking. Next slide. Jesus disciples, Jesus' students, also known as apostles, so sometimes the word means follower, sometimes the word is about being a witness or being sent out, but they are often the little ones. I love the fact that at this point, hearing the kind of things they're saying, they say no one, no one can do this. And they say, give, give us more faith, because we're, we can't possibly do this. So Jesus then starts new word pictures. Next slide, and the next one. This time he talks about mustard seeds and a mulberry tree. Famous in his time, images of something very, very small and then something with incredibly big branches but also huge, deep roots. He says if you've got faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Next slide. Got some images. There's the mustard seed oh, and that mulberry tree. Next slide. Jesus is reacting to them, saying, give us more faith because we can't do this. And it seems to me that Jesus is saying to them, it's not about how much faith you have. Because he doesn't say to them, if you have enough, like a mustard seed, and it would be better if you had more. He says, if you have any faith, even as tiny as a mustard seed, then mulberry trees can be uprooted and put in the sea. Well, that's no use to anyone. So that's not actually going to happen. That's a word picture. But God is the one who is good. God is the one who is part of this creation project and putting it back together. And God is the one that we put our faith in. And that's why things can happen. Not because of our faith, but because of who we have faith in. So it's less about how much faith we have. There's no element in here that says the amount of faith you have affects what happens. It's instead who you have your faith, your trust in. Next slide. Then Jesus tells a story about a servant or a slave, which, to be honest, sounds to our ears, to my ears, pretty obscene. And so I have to remember at this point that this is an ancient story told to an ancient audience. This is not, as we're going to see, a story about whether slavery is right or wrong. This is a story that is set in a little context where Jesus is talking to people that he needs to react and to respond and he's describing an, another picture story and it is a story a picture story that's something they can understand for many of the people he's talking to their experience would be as servants or slaves 
in the Jewish society, if you were down and absolutely on your luck, you would actually sometimes sell yourself into slavery, even to another Jewish family to kind of pay off your debt. And beyond that, they had huge experience as a nation of being in slavery. But he tells a story about a servant or a slave who is doing one set of duties, and then he describes a situation where the servant comes back in from the field. And he says, will you then say, come along now and sit down and eat? And we would all say, yes. Your servant's been out working, they come back into the house, and are you going to give him some tea? Yes. But all of Jesus' listeners next slide are saying, no. Because that's not what the arrangement was. That's not how this is worked out. This is a servant who has a whole set of roles and duties and expectations, and this is not one of them. Next slide. He carries on, and he says, even after, will he, the master, if you like, of this servant or slave, be in debt to you? That's what it means, thank. When he says thank, he doesn't just mean well done in your work. He says, will he be in debt to the servant just because the servant did what he was told to do, prepare the meal, and then eventually get his own food? Again, we might say yes, he's worked hard. Maybe the master owes him something. But all of Jesus' listeners would be saying the same thing. Next slide. No, it's not how their system works. It's not how the picture is about. This is not whether this is right or wrong. There's a huge stretch of this story, right from the fact of the Israelites being slaves at the start, that makes it very clear that slavery is wrong. The fact that we find this story obscene is a good thing, because God's project moves on. But Jesus' story was for a particular time and to get the people around him to respond. Next slide. What Jesus was getting at, I believe, is that he describes a situation where there is someone in a role that they are effectively almost made for, or at least have got themselves into that situation, and there's a complete understanding of what that role is. And if they then perform that role, there's no expectation of that person thinking they have any more credit or thinking they're any more important than anyone else just because they've done what they were expected to do. What Jesus is coming back to is that idea of perspective idea of perspective. When I first said and mentioned the word humility, that's a word that is all about perspective. And I believe Jesus is drawing his followers back to that here. Next slide. This is a story. Jesus is telling a word story. It's an ancient story. It's definitely not a story about, about whether slavery is right or wrong. And in fact, the big sweep of this collection of stories, right from the very first poems about the creation, are that God, in his creation, didn't create servants, didn't create slaves, didn't create little people who were going to worship him. Instead, he built a whole creation project that was to serve itself and each other, and that as part of that project, he wanted partners. And he has created and chosen us, his children, to be those partners in his work. And when we then demonstrate that, next slide, we talk sometimes in this church about how we wrestle with this idea of what God wants from his people as a community. And what God wants is for them to be partners in what he's doing. And what he's doing is blessing the world. He told the Israelites that they were to be a blessing to the world, to be part of what he's doing in the world, healing, fixing, mending, putting the world back together. And we throw around this idea of a church as a blessing machine, designed not to be a nice little club or to keep everything shiny, but to be a servant to its community, to actually make a difference where they are, to be a blessing physically, practically, mentally, spiritually, to the people that we rub up against. And in that machine, every part has a purpose. It's designed, like the cogs in this picture, to be part of that. And the machine doesn't work without those parts. But any one of those parts that is doing what it was made to do may well, like me, get joy from being part of what God is doing. Get satisfaction, get peace, get meaning from that. But that does not for a second mean that I am any more important anyone else. Next slide. Jesus said, so you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, you should say we are not, and I put those words in, special or better servants. We've only done what God made us for. And that is what keeps me so humble. <laughs> Let's take a couple of minutes to reflect and think. Amen. Can I invite our musicians to come back up? Let's all stand together as we worship.
Thank you. 